What I'm going to do is imagine that I'm sitting in a chair more comfortable than this, talking to my grandchildren and explaining how my life had developed. If it was a rocking chair, I guess an older person like me would probably fall asleep about this time of day, so perhaps that's a good thing. As I grew up, I had absolutely no awareness of university research. I was born near Coventry and lived in that city shortly after it had been very badly bombed in 1940. And then we moved to a, a mill town in Yorkshire before finally, when I was a teenager, we moved to Scarborough, which is a holiday resort on the North Sea, North sea coast. None of these cities had universities at that time. Coventry and Bradford, which is really where Shipley is, Coventry and Bradford do now, but not at that time. We didn't have a television at home. My parents were among that small group who thought that television would be very distracting for children, so I didn't have the opportunity to see documentaries or movies which included images of university life. As, a, as I grew up, one of my main ambitions was to be able to travel. And my first thought was to join the Navy, <coughs> influenced no doubt by contact with a naval captain who was a very impressive person. Unfortunately, I'm colorblind. And to the Navy, it's important to be able to distinguish red and green because those are the colors used on navigation lights. I think they do accept colorblind people now, and I presume they just don't let you steer the boat. <laughs> <laughs> So I began to think of other ways. How else could I travel? And wondered whether it would be appropriate to train as an extension officer in agricultural science and travel around the world, particularly to developing countries, helping them to improve their agriculture. And so it was, next slide please, that I went to the University of Nottingham uh, to study agricultural science. Fortunately for me, at that time at least, they offered exactly the same courses to everybody in their first year. And during that time, I realized I'm really not a very practical person. I'm certainly not a businessman. So I probably made the wrong choice. And I became more and more interested in the science that was led by Eric Lamming, who was head of the animal physiology department. And I began to get more awareness of what went on in the lab and, and research. As I approached my last vacation as an undergraduate, I began to think how useful it would be to get experience as an intern in the summer holiday, something which these days is very common. I must in a year get, I would think, 20 requests for people to come and work in the lab. But it was pretty unusual in those days. Now, at that time, next please. This is where I studied, near Nottingham. And this is where my girlfriend, now my wife, lived and worked. <laughs> So, with the hope of being near to her to make weekends easier, I wrote around to nearby universities, Bristol, Cardiff, Oxford, Birmingham, nothing. I'm not even sure if I got replies. The first people to reply were in London, a neurology institute in the centre of London, Institute of Psychiatry, I think it was. And they said, normally we'd be glad to offer you a place, but this year we're moving or decorating or something, so, so we're not able to take on any students. The second person was this man, who later became probably the most important influence in my academic life, Chris Polge, at the Unit of Reproductive Physiology and Biochemistry in Cambridge. So it was just that one chance event that in psych the Psychiatry Institute they were not able to take students that meant that I became a reproductive biologist rather than a neuroscientist. I was very fortunate after I'd graduated from Nottingham to be able to go to work with Chris to do a PhD, uh, freezing semen. Chris is best known as the person who recognized that there are some compounds which protect cells during freezing and thawing. And so any of the methods which he used to pre preserve cells these days probably used something which was based on his initial research. And I was able to work with him to de develop a method which preserved both mot mot motility, movement, and normal structure of that body at the head of the sperm, 
they need both. They need to be able to move, but they also need that sack of enzymes in order to be able to penetrate the membranes around an egg. And the method that we developed preserved both of these aspects and is the basis, really, of methods still used today. My wife and I hoped to travel to Australia for a few years, and we understood, as I was finishing my dissertation, having my oral, that there would be money available in Melbourne, which was a really exciting opportunity for us. So we actually began to pack things. Um, my parents loaned us a car, which we could use to go around to visit the family before we took off, that sort of thing. And we discovered that there wasn't going to be any money available for six months. We couldn't see how we could bridge that gap of six months with the two of us, but also our first child. And at almost exactly the same time, somebody who had been offered a position with Chris turned it down. He had a permanent position at another university and had been attracted by a more interesting project with Chris. But that was just a three-year appointment. And he decided it was more important to him to have the security than the exciting project. The project was to freeze and thaw cattle embryos. And because of my experience of freezing cells, once that person had, had withdrawn, they offered me the post. And of course, we jumped at the chance for several reasons of staying there and being able to take part in that, in that project. What a happy accident. That meant that for the next two years, I worked with this man, Tim Rosen, who was the pioneer for most of the techniques which are used for assisted reproduction in livestock, for recovering embryos, culturing them, handling them, and then putting them back into surrogate mothers to produce offspring. Bob Edwards, of fame for developing human IVF, worked in that reproductive biology unit for a while before he moved down into the university where he carried out most of the research. But this is a group that had fantastic reputation for developing these techniques. And so it was that during that time we produced the first calves from frozen embryos and this is the first one, very unimaginatively called Frosty. But it, it did attract a certain amount of interest, so it was the first time I talked to a television camera and it raised my profile a little bit. So I was very, very pleased to be offered a position with the institute, which we now call Roslyn Institute. At that time, it was known as the Animal Breeding Research Organization. It was totally focusing on animal ge genetics and animal breeding. And they wanted somebody like me to bring in techniques for transferring embryos for breeding experiments or freezing semen. So initially, that was my, my role. After a few years, the ambition was developed of introducing molecular biology into this range of techniques. At the right there, you can see at the top, you can see a pipette injecting several hundred copies of a gene into a nucleus in a very early embryo. And that was the first way that was developed of making genetic changes in animals. In this particular case, it added in genes so that the sheep produced in their milk proteins that could be used to treat human disease. That technique worked, but it was very inefficient and inadequate. Only a very small proportion of the eggs became offspring which passed on the gene and, and in which the gene actually functioned normally. But most importantly, we could not change genes in the animals. We could just add something. A few months later, January one year, my boss and I went to a big international meeting which was in Dublin, uh, where he presented the, the results. And I went into the bar for a drink and spoke to a friend from my days in Cambridge and discovered that a mutual friend had begun to develop methods of nuclear transfer. And this was a life-changing piece of information because if what I was told was true, it should be possible to make the genetic changes we want to make in cells. There's lots of standard cookery methods for doing that. And then do nuclear transfer from them to produce animals which would be exactly the same as the original, except for the precise change that we'd made. And I said to my boss, as we flew back to Edinburgh, I think I should visit Steen Villerson, is the name of the man concerned, who by then was in Calgary, and see if this is true. And I did that, 
and Steen was extremely generous. He com not only confirmed that this was true, but told me how he had done it and spent quite a lot of time talking to me about it. And when I got back to Edinburgh, the group of us, including particularly direct the director, set about raising money for a large-scale project because experiments with uh, animals are expensive, particularly large animals, to try to achieve exactly that, to improve the methods of cloning and to, to then have a way of making precise changes in the animals. And that's the project that ultimately led to the birth of Dolly. A sheep from a breed with a white face, crossbred sheep, being born to a sheep with a black face, it is obviously, as some of you will realize, a Scottish black face ewe. But that color combination could not have been produced by accidental mating. As soon as she was born, we knew that Dolly was exactly what we thought that she was. She was a clone from a cell taken from that white bread, white faced animal. Attracted a huge amount of, of interest, of course. And I say many, many more television cameras after that. Some of you may remember that she died at quite a young age. She was not quite six years old. Or she was six years, not quite seven years old. Because we discovered that she had a lung cancer, which is caused by a virus and for which there is no uh, treatment. It was kinder to end her life than to have her slowly suffocate because of the accumulation of tissue and fluid in her lungs. Sadly, it was Valentine's Day. So Valentine's Day was never quite the same again after that. So what conclusions would I draw? And what advice would I offer to my grandchildren or to the younger people in this audience? Be flexible is one, certainly. Be prepared to change your views as to what you would like to do. From my conversations with, from, with students in this university, not many people have a very strong ambition as to what they want to do, and I think that's quite a good thing. Explore first. The most important thing of all, without a doubt, is find something that you really enjoy doing, for which you have a, pa a passion. You should want to go to work every single morning because you're so interested in it and so excited by it. Even on the door, bo boring days when you know you're going to have to fill in forms or uh, some of the less exciting part of the work. Seize any opportunity that you, you have. Even if you're a little bit anxious, can I do this? Be ambitious at all points. In terms of research, if you do an experiment which has already, in a sense, been done before, you're very unlikely to discover anything very important. Whereas if you reach out into an area where people haven't worked, sometimes you will find something which surprises everybody, which of course is what happens to us with Dolly. You'll have noticed we didn't set out to clone an adult. We set out to culture from cells, actually originally from embryos, as a way of making genetic change. And that was achieved. The method is used commercially around the world for our original reason, our original objective. There are cows produced by a company in the United States which produce human antibodies because of major genetic changes which have been made in them using our cloning technique. So be ambitious. Vision. It's important to have that ambition of what it is that you're trying to achieve. It's almost certain that research these days will require a team because there will be different expertise, in our case, looking after animals, carrying out the surgery, anesthetizing the animals, culturing cells, doing the molecular biology tests. And it was very interesting, again, that the previous speaker mentioned teamwork. I would have described myself as being the leader of the team that produced Dolly, because it's important to recognize the, the absolutely essential contributions that lots of different people made. So we need to learn to build up teams. Work hard. I went to an event in the United States a few years ago which was organized to try to teach children at the age between school and university this lesson of ambition. And there were people there from a whole range of different backgrounds. Novelists, scientists, politicians, the then head of the CIA, a whole range of different backgrounds. And we were asked to speak for a few minutes as to what it was that had, was important in producing success. And essentially, we all said the same thing. Work hard, teamwork, and be lucky. 
I think you are very much more likely to be lucky if you are pushing back the boundaries and if you're working with different people. So I hope very much that you will all find for yourselves a career which you become passionate about. I hope you enjoy it as much as I've enjoyed my research career. I also hope that you're just as lucky. Thank you very much.